In the competitive history of League of Legends, there was one team who stood above the rest. A team more successful and dominant than we had ever seen before. They essentially invented how we play modern League of Legends today and were one of the best Western teams in the history of the game, but as quickly as they exploded onto the scene, they would disappear nearly as fast, and due to the US government no less. Federal officials have announced the largest bust of a hacking ring in U.S. history. Five men are charged with stealing more than 160 million credit and debit card numbers. Intrusions into the networks of NASDAQ, 7-Eleven, JCPenney, Heartland Payment Systems. Um, one of them was a championship gamer who traveled from city to city winning, you know, video game championships and, and things like that. 29-year-old Dimitris Milianitz is in a New Jersey jail. 32-year-old Vladimir Drinkman is in the Netherlands awaiting extradition. The other three are at large. One thing that's important to understand about the early years of League was how different the competitive scene was compared to today. Namely, there were no established leagues with regular seasons or splits for teams to clash in. The only thing out there was tournaments. One of the most popular tournament series were the weekly Gopher Lulls hosted by ESL. These were tournaments that happened every Sunday where teams would play through a massive bracket of best of ones until one was crowned that week's champion. The only prize for each week's tournament was 100 bucks for the winners as well as circuit points to qualify you for a monthly finals bracket, where the winner there would get 250 bucks. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of money in the scene back then, but this was all that was available to the top teams who wanted to compete. Teams wouldn't really enter these tournaments for the cash, but rather they would enter because they wanted to prove they were the best of their region. Since this was the only way for high-level teams to challenge each other regularly in a formal setting, you would have plenty of top players entering these to try and show the world what they were made of. Now, one of the more interesting things about the Gopher LOL system was that anybody could play in them, any group of five players could make accounts on the ESL site and sign up together as there wasn't any sort of rating requirement or qualifying points needed. If you wanted to test your skill against the best players in the world, just look through the team recruitment forms on the league website and you'll find players willing to enter with you. Theoretically, this means it shouldn't have been difficult for new competitive teams to break into the scene and make a name for themselves as each and every week, any group of five newcomers could come along and challenge the best out there, potentially rising to the top themselves, but that almost never happened. The two main regions, North America and Europe, had almost all of their tournaments won by the same few teams. In NA, there was CLG and TSM, who simply developed a stranglehold on the region, winning everything, whereas in Europe, three separate teams named Fnatic, SK Gaming, and a French team called Against All Authority would often trade wins for the weekly tournaments there. Occasionally, you would see a week here or there where a new team that you hadn't heard of before would get first place and win it all, but that was typically only when the bigger teams were too busy and didn't bother to enter. Just to illustrate how far ahead these top teams were compared to everyone else, some of them famously didn't bother practicing or scrimmaging others for improvement. CLG in particular was known for this. At one period of time, they were so far ahead of everyone else in North America that they figured there wasn't a reason for organized practice. They could already win everything by a mile, and scrimmaging other lesser teams below them would only give those lesser teams practice and exposure to their own strategies. So for them, they figured it was just better to hone their skills individually through practicing in solo queue. This sounds like an insane strategy nowadays, but it actually worked for a while. That's just how far ahead all the top teams were. This of course resulted in fans being subjected to seeing the exact same names win every single tournament for months on end, which got some people pretty upset. Those who were on top were reaping the rewards of growing their fan base and getting viewers on their own streams, continuously proving that they could not be beat throughout the entirety of season one. Nearly every tournament was won by these select few. That is until... Oh no, Genja's gonna get caught out here by Ocelot. It will be Gosu actually they turn to. Genja does use that ulti. Gosu actually popping his own ulti. Oh my god! Karthus ulti backed him with it. Wow! They were not expecting that. SK just got in destroyed! Suddenly a newcomer appeared out of nowhere, Team Empire from Europe. 
five new faces that nobody had ever heard of before came together and just started beating all the other top European teams. This was a hugely exciting development at the time, as this may have been the first time a group of five truly new faces joined the competitive scene. Prior to this, there was some roster shuffling amongst the more established teams, particularly in Europe, so occasionally you would see one player from a big team leave and then go start up a new organization, where this is pretty much the only way we would see quote unquote new competitive teams form, but they weren't really new since they would still have a roster filled with old familiar faces that you had already seen on other top teams. Naturally, seeing them go and then take home a go for lol or something wasn't quite as exciting or nearly surprising. But Team Empire was the exception to this rule. Darien in top lane, Diamond Prox in jungle, Alex Ish mid, and Genja and Gosu Pepper bot lane, these were five players, almost all hailing from Russia, that nobody had even heard of before, and shockingly, they seemed able to beat the best of Europe right out of the gate. Empire played in one go for lol where they would get fourth place, and then in the very next one, they won it all. This qualified them for the monthly finals in October, where again, they would enter and win it all. This is one of the things that made their entrance into the competitive scene so memorable, just how explosive it was. Like this wasn't some up and comer who was constantly getting poor placing for years before they finally managed to win something. This kind of success from new teams simply wasn't something you would ever see. So of course, some hype began building around them. After these exciting wins, they would quickly get sponsored and branded under a new organization appropriately named Moscow 5. But there were still a few questions about how good this team really was in those early days. They had never played in a LAN environment at any sort of live tournament yet, as their limited professional experience only came in online tournaments where they got to play from the comfort of their own home. And if you want to be nitpicky, these gopher lulls that they won didn't have too many of Europe's best teams, nobody really knew if they would be able to translate their early performance to the live international stage yet, at least until IEM Kiev. Kiev would be one of the most competitive tournaments the world had seen up until that point. The tournament originally was supposed to host the number one top team from almost every region, but there were some visa issues that prevented that. This was back when esports was still a very new concept to the world, so the number one Chinese team at the time, Invictus Gaming, was unable to participate due to a visa rejection. There was also an up-and-coming team from North America called A Picture of a Goose that was unable to participate and was instead replaced with Team Curse. But the competition here was still fierce. Against all authority, the runners-up to the Season 1 World Finals, SK Gaming, at this point the best team in Europe, Dignitas, the new kings of North America, and TSM, a historically good NA organization, all stood in the way of these Russian rookies. This was also in 2012, a full two years after League had been released, meaning that players were getting pretty good at the game at this point, a meta had developed, mistakes were less common, teams had better draft phases, better mechanics, and were no longer pushovers susceptible to cheesy strategies. M5 were essentially the David going up against not just one, but four Goliaths. However, the Russians had a strategy that they thought could help them go toe-to-toe -to -toe against every other top team out there, and in this tournament, M5 would showcase that strategy to the world, changing the way teams played League of Legends forever. So if you've ever paid attention to high-level League of Legends play, you've probably heard players, casters, and analysts use this one particular word, priority. Lane priority, jungle priority, what exactly does that mean? Essentially, priority refers to the ability of one player's team being able to come and give assistance to them faster than their counterpart on the enemy team. So for instance, if we take a look at this freeze frame from a hypothetical game, we can see three players on each team, two in the top lane, two in the jungle, and two in the mid lane. The jungler on blue side here is making an aggressive move towards his enemy's jungle in the hopes of stealing the red buff, which would give him a pretty big advantage early on in the match. But the enemy jungle is still nearby and is going to potentially be able to defend. However, the invading jungler here still has the advantage because his team has lane priority. In the two closest lanes, both of his teammates are pushed to the enemy tower, which gives him an advantage. If he runs into the enemy jungle, his lane 
laners are going to be able to come and help him faster than the enemy's laners would be able to. That's because his laners have just cleared out the minions in the lane and are free to roam around without any sort of consequences, while the enemy laners on the opposing team are forced to farm their gold and experience from the minions under their tower, since if they leave, the minions will just die to the tower and they won't be there to get the precious gold and experience they need. So because of this, the jungler here has lane priority and he's able to make this aggressive invade into the enemy jungle hoping to get an advantage. The enemy jungler can't really defend here because he's going to end up being outnumbered because his teammates are stuck in their lanes. Similarly, the laners here also have jungle priority, meaning that they can keep pushing and being aggressive because of the same thing. Let's say the red side top laner calls for help here, asking for his jungler to come to his lane and ambush the enemy top laner for a two versus one gank. That's still okay for blue team, since blue side top laner knows that the enemy jungler isn't in range to do anything like that. His jungler is standing in the way of the path the enemy jungler would have to take, so not only does he have vision here thanks to his teammate and knows that the enemy isn't in a position to make a play like that right now, but even if the enemy does come and try and set something up, his teammate is going to be there to likely meet the opposing jungler and stop them. All of this meaning that our top lane friend here can continue pushing, being aggressive, and not having to worry about the enemy team collapsing on him. Priority is an important mechanic to understand in League, since it can allow you to make very aggressive moves that could potentially give you huge advantages, even if you don't have direct vision on all the enemy players on the minimap. The reason I'm bringing this up is because these are basic fundamentals of every professional League of Legends match nowadays, and Moscow 5 kind of invented it. Before M5, the meta that existed at the time was something much more simple. Each laner would just sit in their lane, trying to beat their lane opponent one versus one with an expectation that they're just gonna stay in that lane until the late game. The mantra that players had was win lane, win game. They would focus on out farming their opponent in lane, last hitting more minions, possibly trying to kill the enemy lane opponent if they can one versus one, but otherwise just sitting in lane, continuing to farm items until the late game. The expectation was that the jungler would play around the lanes with a very gank heavy, somewhat supportive play style. So most of the popular junglers at the time were the ones that were best at ganking, such as Skarner or Lee Sin. This heavy focus on playing around the laners also led to the development of strategies like freezing a minion wave. If one player chose to push a minion wave in a lane, the defending player with some careful manipulation could keep that minion wave frozen in that exact spot. Meaning that if the enemy laner wanted to come and farm some of their own creeps, they would have to stand very far forward in lane, making them susceptible to a jungle gank, so freezing the wave was considered one of the best strategies out there, and players who pushed waves in non-stop were widely considered kind of awful. But Moscow 5 turned the game on its head when they came into the scene and changed the way we look at League. They picked champions who did nothing but push minion waves. They would pick champions that were widely considered awful by everyone else, stuff like Mordekaiser, specifically because they were good at pushing minion waves. The enemy team could try and freeze the minion wave if they wanted to, but that would just give Moscow 5 lane priority and allow them to leave lane, invade the enemy jungle, and do whatever they wanted. And this is where their favorite champion, who they became very well known for, came in, Shiv Shivana. Shivana was a jungler who nobody believed in. She had no crowd control, no slows, no stuns, which means she's generally pretty awful at ganking, and if she's awful at ganking, why would you bother playing her? She can't play around the laners the way other good junglers like Skarner or Lee Sin can. But Shivana has one big strength those other champions don't. She's great in the early game when it comes to map presence. More specifically, she has some of the fastest jungle clear times and can easily get ahead of the other jungler by powerful farming a little bit, which of course means that she can then go and invade the enemy's jungle, start stealing a bunch of camps to get a gold and level advantage, and if anyone ever tries to contest her, she'll likely be able to outdamage them and 1v1 them, because she has very high base damages, no mana, and a ton of other things that make her very good at this very specific playstyle. By picking her, M5 were able to base their gameplay around controlling the map, getting priority in lanes, allowing their jungler to invade and steal camps, while being supported by their laners when they look to take important objectives for their team all over the map. This would give them massive leads in the early game. They'd get so far ahead they could just push down the enemy base, winning fights if anyone tried to stop them, and more often than not, M5 could look to win a game by the 20 minute mark. 
Even if things dragged on longer than that, they would typically have a backup plan as well, while their mid laner, top laner, and jungler were typically all early game aggressive champions, their bot lane would be much more oriented towards scaling. They would almost always at least have one hyper late game scaler on the team like a Kog'Maw AD carry, just in case the match went on too long, they still wanted to have a backup plan and a win condition so teams couldn't just hope to drag a game out as long as possible, and this strategy worked like a charm. I can't over state the significance of M5 and what they did for how teams look at League of Legends. Their contributions to dissecting the mechanics of the game are still seen today. While every meta before them, League was all about playing around the lanes, now it was about playing around the map, playing around the jungler, playing as a team who aren't afraid to leave lane, push in waves, rotate around the map, and be proactive. And of course, with Moscow 5 being the team to develop these new strategies, they got to reap a whole lot of rewards. If we go back to the event at hand, IEM Kiev, we would see Moscow 5 easily sweep through the group stage, not dropping a single game. In bracket, they would sweep SK Gaming two games to nothing to qualify for the finals, where they would face off against TSM. In the grand finals, best of three, as if they hadn't pulled out enough crazy strategies in the earlier parts of the tournament, they would start doing even more new stuff. For instance, after running Shivana Jungle all tournament, during one of their matches, they would go for an early first pick Shivana. Now, TSM would obviously expect that to be a Shivana jungle, but instead, Moscow 5 would run that pick top lane. This worked out insanely well as it synergized with their strategy perfectly. Their top laner, Darian, was able to use the good wave clear Shivana has, which is what normally makes her a very good jungler, and instead use it to constantly push his lane, letting him always have lane priority so he could leave lane to steal jungle creeps, roam, and gank even more than he had already been doing earlier in the tournament. Almost every team would start trying to learn how to run Shivana top lane after seeing Darian's success. They would also break out Ken and AD carry, which blew a lot of people's minds. At the time, most teams considered Kennen a very high priority champion, someone that you have to pick or ban, but only because he was threatening as a mid lane mage. If he went down mid lane, he was considered one of the best champions in the game because of his incredibly high magic damage. He had one of the easiest laning phases in game, he transitioned into one of the best team fighters late game as well, and all of this was because he had some of the highest magic damage on top of some of the longest ranges on his abilities, meaning that he can burst someone down from 100% health to zero before they can even reach him to attack back. But M5 would stick their physical damage carry, Genja, on Kennen and use him in a completely different way. See, Kennen had all these really weird hidden stats that synergized with how attack damage and attack speed scaling works in League. Basically, Kennen had one of the highest base attack speeds in League, and the way that attack speed scaling works is every attack speed item you buy will give you a percentage bonus of your base attack speed. So the higher base attack speed you have, the more efficient it is for you to build attack speed items. I won't get too much into the math of how all this works. All you need to know is that even though every one of Kennen's abilities scales with magic damage, meaning that he's supposed to be played as a mage, these weird obscure stats and the odd way they work make Kennen a surprisingly good physical damage carry instead. It's a really strange strategy that took some creative people to figure out how it worked, and those creative people were Moscow 5. Like the Shivana top lane, they would first play Kennen AD carry with no prior practice or experience in competitive play in these grand finals. In fact, I believe these two picks here were the first recorded instances in League of Legends history of these champions being used this way, and boy did it work out well, M5 would beat TSM two games to one. It's easy to get lost in the hype of how innovative and straight up fun Moscow 5 were for League's competitive scene, but remember, this was still their very first major tournament they ever attended. In fact, it was so early in their careers that most of their players were dirt poor. I mean, they hadn't won any real money from anything else so far, so the individual players of M5 couldn't even afford to play the game on good enough PCs that allowed them to stream. For being, and, and, uh, for being that MVP. And interestingly enough, you know, some of these Moscow 5 players, uh, Alex said in his interview, 
their computers are not good enough to stream. Well, they might be if they get MVP, that's for sure. <laughs> the victory here would be a monumental success for Moscow 5, but it was still just the beginning. They would continue entering tournaments, the next of which would be an event called Kings of Europe. Here, they would end up getting second place to a team called CLG EU, and this would be significant as CLG EU would turn into the longtime rivals for Moscow 5. They mainly turned into their rivals because as time went on, CLG EU would be the only team that could regularly beat the Russians, but in spite of this second place finish, M5 would still steamroll ahead onwards and upwards to the next event, and the next event was a doozy. The IEM Season 6 World Championship. This was a tournament with one of the biggest prize pools League had seen up until that point, $50,000 to first place, and all the best teams in the world were vying for that. A total of 12 competitors from North America, Europe, and even China would end up attending. For reference, that's more teams than were at the Season 1 World Championship. This event in general would dwarf the Season 1 Finals as it had a much higher caliber of competition with a similar prize pool. It would be the toughest test that all these teams had faced in their pro careers up until this point. So how did M5 fare? Well, they didn't lose a single game. But if anyone's come by as well, there's the true pool off. There's oh, the ult. Nice. This could be pretty bad. Darian taking a lot of damage. Flashes out of the Morgana ult. This might look really good for them. The flash is still going down. Morgana and Amimu running. Looks like one more is going to fall. Will Morgana fall? Yes, she will as well. Three kills for nothing. Moscow fight with an incredible push right there. Wow, Genjo was just face first into that fight the entire time. Warwick coming in with the suppress. And it looks like they could have the grab to pull Genja back out. He dodges. Warwick with another attack, but too slow. Will they get him? in the turret, and Imbo will go down as Corky also falls. A double kill for Moscow Darian 5. Teleporting in the, the Howling Girl. No, Big Fat LP is going to come in and support them. And actually, Ghostly Pepper using the ulti. Meanwhile, you can see Diamonds driving in. Can they get a lock on? Oh, they did get a lock on. Very nicely played. Now they're on towards Chowster. Chowster has popped his ulti to try and get away from this one. Will he be slowed enough by double over the AT? Will he's going to get caught out, and that's going to even up the kills. It will be all square. Look, Diamonds is going to go in. He smites it straight away. On towards I will dominate. First blood will be coming down here. You can See, meanwhile, they're pushing across towards Ghost and Pepper. They're going to try and lock them in, but first blood. There's a swap. Is immediately onto Scar. Scar not in a good place. Flashes over the wall. That's probably the best time for them to do so. They're going to do as much damage as they can. He's now dueling Darian. Darian picks up that kill there. It looks like Alex not going down either. Picks up the kill onto Corky. They're still dominating this fight right now. I will dominate managing to actually steal away the Baron, which is a big deal, but they've not picked up any kills and they will get ace for it. And well, that is it. Well played, Moscow 5. They are the world champions here at Intel Extreme Masters at CBIT. It has been a fantastic performance from them and a really well-deserved championship. And what a great celebration from these guys. You know, it means a lot to know $50,000 has been taken for this Russian team. They were champions in Kiev and they've continued their dominance, losing one game across two events. When you hear a phrase like that, they didn't lose a single game, it's easy to miss the impact of what that means, but take a second to think about it. This doesn't happen anymore, really ever. Even the world champions we see nowadays will still drop games in the group stage or in a best of series. That's because everyone sees their strategies eventually. You would think that someone could pull off a cheesy strategy against them or that the second best team could take a game off them in a best of, but here, nobody could do anything. This was a group of Russian superstars who were so far ahead of the meta that the rest of the world's top players were just dumbfounded. You'd think with everyone knowing M5's strategies after seeing Kiev, they'd be more prepared for it, but nope. M5 were still invading and pressuring, they still had a much better understanding of the game than everyone else. Individual players like their support Gosu Pepper ran unconventional strategies like tankier support runes, which allowed him to be much more aggressive in laning phase. M5 in general was just crazy aggressive overall, running weird picks like Clairvoyance Exhaust Nunu Support, Urgot AD Carry, Flash Heal Trindamir Mid, what? Even when their signature champion Shivana was picked or banned away from them in nearly every game, they still performed insanely well, proving to the world that they weren't simply running one weird strategy. They had legitimately good play and solid game plans that nobody else could replicate. 5-0 in group stage, 4-0 in bracket, Moscow 5 were the undisputed champions of the world. 
After the end of this tournament, M5 would go into a little bit of a slump in their placings. They had a few uncharacteristically bad tournaments here or there, but for the most part, they would still end up getting top three in almost everything they attended. Most of the times they got second place was to their rivals, CLG EU. See, the reason M5 struggled so much against CLG in particular was M5 had this crazy, fast, aggressive style of play, whereas CLG was the polar opposite. M5 wanted to be aggressive early, going for the kills, going for snowballing games as quickly as possible, but their rivals were incredibly good at slowing the pace of a match down. They had players who synergized with that kind of slower playstyle very well, like their star mid laner Froggen, whose signature champion Anivia is notorious for good wave clear, making it nearly impossible to push against her and close out a match. This clash in playstyles heated the rivalry up, turning it into one of the most exciting rivalries of its time. Even though during a lot of this time, M5 was considered the best team in the world, they would still always lose to CLG EU if they had to face them in a tournament. Even if they got one of their perfect early games going, CLG could always slow the game down long enough until they hit their own scaling. In fact, these two teams would play in one series at the DreamHack 2012 Finals, where in Grand Finals, CLG EU dragged a single match out so long that it lasted longer than an hour in one of the greatest comebacks in League of Legends history but that's a story for another time. After some of these disappointing performances following their IEM win, M5 would continue entering everything they could. There was one event where they had to forfeit because their team was unable to attend, but after that, they would put together one of the craziest runs in the world of competitive League of Legends. M5 would enter 16 tournaments over the course of three months, of which they would take first place in 14 of them. Some of these tournaments had unusual structures like the Into Lull King of the Hill series. This was an event where two teams would play and whoever won would get first place for that week, the prize money, as well as a chance to defend their title the next week. Five of M5's wins would come from this, where they would take first place, and then would simply not drop it for the rest of the event. Some of these tournaments were online, some were small, some were simply qualifiers for larger stuff, some were the larger stuff, but regardless, M5 won everything. They simply beat everybody in every way possible. They had no problem with Koreans when they eventually faced them, even though this was when Koreans were beginning to dominate the league competitive scene. They had no problems dealing with their rivals, CLG EU, where before this streak, they were 1-6 against them all time. During the streak, they went 4-0. They beat amateur teams, they beat the best Europe had to offer, they beat NA teams, they beat everyone. This kind of winning streak is not something we had ever seen before, and it's likely not something we'll ever see again. It all culminated in Moscow 5 winning the European qualifiers for the Season 2 World Championships, collecting $40,000 in their pocket along the way. Everything was going their way absolutely everything. But eventually, every successful run has to come to an end. Five Russians and a Ukrainian were charged by a U.S. court for stealing more than 160 million credit card numbers, resulting in millions of dollars in losses. Владимир Дримкман родился в интеллигентной сыктывкарской семье. Мать Татьяна Борисовна работала в канцелярии СГУ. Отец возглавлял отдел технического обслуживания. Four Russians and a Ukrainian have been charged with hacking and fraud. Authorities have been pursuing the hackers for years. As early as 2010, the FBI had begun an investigation into a Russian group of hackers who engaged in a long-time credit card scam. This started when two individuals, Dmitry Similianets and Vladimir Drinkman, met each other playing Counter-Strike back in 2003. They were both notorious hackers in-game and upon meeting each other quickly became friends. They'd hang out online playing games together, but also in real life too, regularly going fishing or drinking vodka in what blossomed into a pretty close friendship. After two years or so of spending time together, Together, the pair would eventually start a scam where they would hack into computer networks of financial companies. They would mainly focus on breaching any sort of payment systems or online stores where they could find credit card numbers, and then after gaining access to that data, they would turn around and sell it online for 10 to 50 bucks per stolen credit card. They intruded on a number of companies and financial institutions all over the US and Europe, stealing a total of 160 million credit cards and causing damages of up to $300 million. 
It was called the biggest cyber fraud case in history. The two would be on an excursion to the Netherlands for vacation in mid-2012 when FBI authorities would arrest them. After a couple of months, they would be extradited to the United States to stand trial, a trial that would end up lasting nearly three years. They were facing up to 35 and 25 years in prison for their crimes initially and would both end up pleading guilty. In February of 2018, Drinkman would be sentenced to 12 years in prison, Similionette would be sentenced to 51 months time served and would be released. Dmitry Similionets was the founder and owner of Moscow 5. The arrest of M5's owner couldn't have come at a worse time for their League of Legends team. Immediately, the organization began having solvency issues as their financial accounts had presumably been frozen by the FBI. At the Season 2 World Championship, which occurred shortly after their owner's arrest, M5 would put on a pretty good performance. They only ended up losing to the eventual world champion Taipei Assassins, still securing a tied third place. But unfortunately, this would be the last high point for the roster under the name Moscow 5. Shortly after Worlds, the organization would fold and the League of Legends roster would be released. Now, it may not be fair to blame the FBI for the end of M5's dominance. While they did obviously end up destroying the esports organization as a whole, the League of Legends roster would still stick together. They would rejoin a new Russian organization named Gambit Gaming, with all five players still there ready to compete. When all was said and done, they likely weren't affected by the whole ordeal apart from some possible mental stress, but regardless of whether this event changed them or not, Gambit Gaming would simply never look as good as Moscow 5. Gone were the days of the roster instilling fear into their opponents, always showing up as a potential competitor to take first place. Instead, the years with Gambit would be filled with inconsistency and mediocrity. That's not to say the roster did nothing as Gambit, you would still see flashes of the potential that the players had from time to time. For instance, one of the great things about this roster was how well they performed against Koreans. They entered the League of Legends scene right as the era of Korean dominance had begun, but for some reason or another, Koreans couldn't ever break them the way they seemed to break all the other Western teams. At the Season 3 World Championship, Gambit would beat Samsung Ozone once in group stage and then again in a tiebreaker to knock them out of the whole tournament. Up until this most recent 2018 Worlds, it was the only time a Korean team had been eliminated in the group stage of a World Championship. At that Worlds, Gambit would only end up getting knocked out themselves by another Korean team, Najin Black Sword, in a very close two games to one set. But as the years went by, Gambit would eventually see their roster fall apart. We had entered the LCS era now, a span of years marked by regular season leagues that had sprung up all across the world instead of those old tournament circuit formats, and Gambit sadly weren't built for that. Their star mid laner Alex Ish would end up leaving the team, stating the difficulty of traveling from his home in Russia to Cologne, Germany every week where the EU LCS games were played. It was too much of a strain on his family life, as Alex had been married for a number of years now. As he left, the rest of the roster would continue on a downward slope. In the 2014 LCS splits, they would get 5th place, 5th place, and then 7th, the latter result forcing them to play through a relegation series to stay in the league. They would beat SK Gaming, managing to hang around for a little while longer, but they wouldn't do any better following this. Eventually, the team would be relegated a few splits later and ended up disbanding. However, we are missing one really big piece of this story. Although most of their success did come when they were Moscow 5, the Gambit roster would end up having one magical tournament run right after joining their new organization. It would be the first instance of them playing under the Gambit name at IEM Katowice. Their play had already begun to decline and deteriorate with mediocre performances that were nowhere near their previous highs. Naturally, they were no longer favorites to show up and win everything they entered, and their team's struggles were pretty evident in the group stage of this event. The only win Gambit would be able to muster was against a Polish team called Meet Your Makers. Other than that, they would lose not only to the Korean team Azubu Blaze, but even to Team Curse, who in those years was a pretty mediocre North American team. With this embarrassing loss and a score of just one win, two losses, there's no possible way they could make it out of group stage, right? They may turn this is straight towards the Nexus. Curse Gaming are gonna knock Gambit Gaming out of the tournament. A beautiful comeback from what looked like Gambit's game. 
However, something interesting ended up happening. Azubu Blaze would win the group by beating everyone, but the rest of the three teams would all end up with the same record. Gambit would beat MYM, MYM would beat Curse, and Curse would beat Gambit, creating a three-way tie for second. This tournament didn't have tiebreakers as it was on a fairly strict schedule that didn't allow for extra games, so instead, in the event of a group stage tie, they would determine who advanced into the bracket by a time coefficient, adding the game times of the losses while subtracting the game times of the wins to see who lost slower and managed to win faster combined, whoever had the best time would advance into the bracket stage. This was a pretty obscure rule, even for those early days of League, and it's obviously not something we've seen any time recently, but here, it paid off for Gambit. They would advance by just a few minutes. They had a chance at life here. This frustrating disappointment could all be turned around, but it wouldn't be easy. Two of Korea's best teams, Azubu Frost and Azubu Blaze, stood in their way to the championship. But again, you have to remember that, unlike the rest of the West, Gambit doesn't have problems with playing Koreans. in towards that fight. Here we go then, all hanging around by the middle. Actually, Alex just diving away, but Cloud Temple are gonna get the ulti down. There is a crescendo coming out of Edward. He's already fairly low, and look at Rapid Star falling so, so quickly. Cloud Temple are now the focus on that one. We are gonna see Alex Hitch come in. He's got the reset. He's gonna jump over, gets the slow. goes down, Rapid Star puts the ultimate down, catches everyone out. They're going in though. It's gonna be a diamond towards Madlock. Get just desperately taking the turret down. He gets it down. Rapid Star gets taken down. Sorry, Madlock gets dropped as well. They're gonna dive towards it. They can't catch up towards Cloud Temple. One more hit will be in. Darian takes it down. Darian's gonna go towards Rapid Star. Rapid Star is Ed. Edward's gonna take the tower damage. Dark Frost dives in. It's obliteration there for Azumu Frost. And Genja so, so strong. He is gonna fall down. Double kill in the end there for Genja. And Gambit Gaming are going to take the Nexus down. And 2 0 Azubu Frost. It's G, 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 G. But look at Genja turning the aggression towards Ambition. The Ignite going down. Now he's on towards Captain Jack. Here comes Diamond Props around the side. They're gonna get on towards Captain Jack. It's gonna be first look. Captain Jack goes down. Alex Hitch coming around the side now. He's gonna push the wave. They're gonna go in towards Ambition. Evelyn comes around. Alex tries to pull the damage down. Edward picks up the kill. Completely spent aside from the Shen all. They're just gonna go for this inhibitor right here. And they're gonna go diving straight in towards Flame there. Captain Jack gets stunned them. They're gonna go straight in. That is they absolutely exploded from the map. And this could be it. This could be a big, big push from Gambit Gaming. Every Intel Extreme Master Sector. Then Will. And it is going to be the Russian team, the newly born team, taking it home. 2 0. I'm the new favorite they team, I think. They are on their feet, everyone here. An amazing, amazing crowd as well. And that can happen when you've got the support of a crowd this big. That can really help you. And let's be honest, Gambit have been so confident all day after they flashed Frost, after they destroyed Blaze in game number one. I don't, I, you'd have to be a crazy person to say that they were going to lose this second game. This is the biggest momentum shift I've ever seen in a League of Legends tournament. Everyone thought Gambit Gaming was dead. People were talking about M5 being over a couple days ago. Just listen to this crowd. Now